Okay, here we are with section 8.5, the sum and difference formula. So it says, in past sections, many common angles have been found and memorized, and they're referring to the values on our unit circle. Um, but what if what it was asked to find the measure of an angle that is not memorized without a calculator? For example, cosine of 15 degrees. One method for doing this would be to rewrite the angle in terms of angles that are known. For example, cosine of 15 degrees equals cosine of 60 degrees minus 45 degrees. So how does this help us? Um, we know the values like sine of 60 degrees and cosine of 60 degrees. And we know the values of sine of 45 degrees and cosine of 45 degrees. So if we had an identity where we could use these values that we already know to evaluate this, then we would be able to figure out what cosine of 15 degrees is. So they're gonna go through how we, how these identities were discovered, okay? And so what some mathematician did somewhere at some point in time was they started to look at this image here and they asked themselves if I had a large angle like alpha that had a terminal side and this point here with the coordinates cosine alpha sine alpha and I had a smaller angle beta whose terminal side is this thing and that terminal point is there with the coordinates of cosine beta sine beta what if I wanted to take alpha minus beta, and that would leave me with this angle here, okay? Then they said, well, let's go look and examine what is the distance between those two points? If you connect them with the straight line, what is the distance? What is the length of this line? So we're gonna use the distance formula to calculate that. So the second y value, cosine of alpha, minus the first y value, x value, I'm sorry, cosine of beta, plus the second y sine alpha minus the first y sine beta and square it. And if you take this and you actually multiply it by itself and you foil it all out and you combine your like terms, you do end up with cosine squared alpha minus two sine, cosine alpha cosine beta plus cosine squared beta. Similarly, if you take this and you multiply it by itself, you foil it all out, you combine your like terms, you end up with sine squared alpha minus two sine alpha sine beta plus sine squared beta. Then these two guys, cosine squared of an angle plus sine squared of the same angle is one. And these two guys, cosine squared beta plus sine squared beta equals another one. And one plus one is where this two came from. And then this term was brought down and this term was brought down. Notice that P1 and P2 is the segment across from the angle alpha minus beta, right? It's the line across from alpha minus beta. If we rotate this angle so that it is in standard position, we obtain the following. So P1 and P2 are gonna rotate, <coughs> excuse me, and P1 will end up landing here on the x-axis, and now P2 is in the standard position for this angle. So then that point can, the coordinates of that point can actually be written as cosine of alpha minus beta and sine of alpha minus beta. And this point here being that it's on the unit circle is one comma zero. So then we want to still find the length of this. Now it's going to be the same measurement as that one. The angle did not change, which means that that length doesn't change, right? If I put my, let's do this just for purpose, right? So one of my nails, my left nail ends at the silver point of the pin. And then my other nail ends right here at this clip. Now, if I take this triangle and I rotate it, I did not change my angle, which means that my length of this pin does not change, right? My middle finger is still at the same point on the pin and my index finger is still at the same point um, near the clip on the pin. So that length is the same regardless if it's in this position or if it's in this position. The length is still the same. So these, once I do this, I will be able to say that this 
length should be equivalent to this length and then start manipulating the equation from there. So here I'm gonna take, this is my second point. So this X value minus this X value, this Y value minus that Y value. If I FOIL this out, take this whole thing times itself and FOIL it out, I get cosine squared of alpha minus beta minus two, cosine of alpha minus beta plus one. Here, I'm not minusing anything, so sine, so if I square that, I just get sine squared alpha minus beta. Now again, I have a cosine squared plus a sine squared of the same angle, so I get one. I had a one that was here already, so that's this one, and then I brought this term down. So then one plus one is two, so I have two minus two cosine alpha minus beta. Now we mentioned that, that, in, that distance should be the same even after the rotation, right? So the first square root we got should be equivalent to the second square root that we got. Now, if I square both sides, I just get this radicand and this radicand. I minus two on both sides. I end up with this term and these two terms. And then I divided by two to all three terms. So I got positive cosine of this, um, positive cosine alpha of cosine beta, and positive sine alpha of sine beta. So then we have eventually derived the fact that this is the bottom formula here. So we've derived that formula. We know where it comes from, how it came to be, right? Has to do with the two points and the difference of the angle and then rotating that angle around and finding the lengths of both of the triangles when it wasn't in standard position and then when it was in standard position. So then now we can use that, that rule to figure out how to do cosine of alpha plus beta. So you can write a plus as minus a negative, right? Because the double negative is a positive. And so then don't get hung up on alpha and beta. They're just what they call dummy variables. Alpha is just representing the first angle and beta is representing the second angle. So I would rather you keep that in mind than just alpha and beta. Especially here when the first angle is alpha, yeah, but the second angle is negative beta. So be careful, okay? So I'm gonna say cosine of the first angle, so cosine of alpha cosine of the second angle, which is cosine of negative beta. Sine of the first angle, which is cosine of a, I mean sine of alpha, and then sine of the second angle, so sine of negative beta. Then you use your even and odd function properties, and so cosine of negative beta is the same as positive cosine of beta, and sine of negative beta is the same as negative sine of positive beta. And then these two stay the same, but a positive times a negative will eventually make a negative in the middle, and so now we've derived the second formula, okay? And so then that's great. We've gone through all of that on how these came to be, right? So now we know they exist and we know that they're true, but how do we apply them? So going back to our first example, how can you find the exact, or the first thing that they mentioned in this section, right? It wasn't really an example, but if we go back to that, how can we find the exact value of cosine of 15 degrees? So 15 degrees is 60 degrees minus 45 degrees. So if I apply the formula at the bottom, I get the cosine of the first angle, cosine of the second angle, plus sine of the first angle and sine of the second angle. From my unit circle, I know that the cosine of 60 degrees is the x value, which is one half, cosine of 45 degrees, x value is square root of two over two, Sine of 60 degrees is the y value, square root of 3 over 2. And sine of 45 degrees is the y value, which is square root of 2 over 2. And then I multiply top times top, bottom times bottom, top times top, bottom times bottom. And then this is this already has a common denominator, so I just went ahead and put it as one giant fraction. Now, if you use the calculator in degree mode, you do get the exact same thing, right? Square root of 2 plus square root of 6, addition is commut commutative. So Switching the terms over is still equivalent. Square root of six plus square root of two is the exact same as this, okay? So these are the same, and a calculator does do the problem. But on a review or a test, if you're asked to do it without a calculator, if it literally says to do that without a calculator, and all you have is this and then the answer, you're not going to get credit. I would suggest that if it says that, that you make sure that you know the mechanics behind how this is coming about, okay? 
because I don't want you to lose credit on the test for something that, yes, it can be done in the calculator. Good, use that to check your answer, but don't use that to do the problem when the problem says do it without a calculator, right? So, um, and why do I make you do it without the calculator? Because it's very much possible that when you get to Cal 1, your teacher will not allow you to have a calculator at all. Not to graph, not to do trig, nothing. You just have to know how to do everything. Or it can happen to you in Cal 2. You could come, become dependent in this class on the calculator. And then when you get to Cal 1 and they tell you you can't use one, you're out of luck. Or you get dependent on it in this class and you get dependent on it in Cal 2, on Cal 1, I'm sorry. And then you move on to Cal 2 and now your Cal 2 teacher says, nope, you're not allowed to use a calculator, okay? Or you use it for pre-Cal, you use it for Cal 1, you use it for Cal 2, and then you get to Cal 3 and your teacher says you can't use the calculator. And the stuff's in 3D, by the way, in Cal 3, okay? That happens to me. I use the calculator in pre-Cal, I use the calculator in Cal 1, I use the calculator in Cal 2, and when I went to the university and I took Calculus 3, the calculus was not the problem. The problem was, is they took the calculator away from me and now I had to remember all of this stuff because if my answer was this and the test happened to be a multiple choice, I couldn't tell you what this was equivalent to when all the things look like this, but have minus here, minus there, two down here, all kinds of weird stuff, right? I couldn't tell you which one of those was equivalent to this without a calculator. I wouldn't know, okay? But if I knew my trig, I would have known these identities. I would have been able to apply them. I would have been able, if I memorized my unit circle, I would have been able to find all these little individual values and I would have had no problem at all if I could figure out this problem, okay? So it's very important that yes, it's nice to have a calculator, but please, please, please follow the directions in your homework and on the reviews and on the test. It's very important, not just that you know how to use the calculator, but that you know how these answers are coming about, where they're coming from, okay? We've already gone over where all of these values are coming from. We've already talked about it, okay? Um, so we know where these values are coming from. Now, whether we remember or not, maybe, maybe the case, but we know where these are coming from. And as long as I memorized my unit circle, I'm good in that topic, okay? So for example, two, it's going in the reverse way, right? So they have the expanded version of that formula. So it's actually this formula up top because it's got a minus in the middle, but you've got cosine, cosine, sine, sine, and a minus in the middle. So that means it's going to be cosine of the first angle, which is 40 degrees, plus sine of the second, or plus uh, the second angle, which is 80 degrees. And if I add those together, I get 120, and my, I always think in terms of radians. So I, when I did this, I converted it to radians and then I used my memorization to figure that out. But if you have your unit circle and you have both the degrees and the radian, um, one, you don't have to worry about converting it because it's already there, right? And two, I don't have to worry about that. So I know that this point has the same coordinates as this. It's just that when I'm in this quadrant, the X value should be negative. So I'm gonna take the same coordinates, but this guy's gonna be negative. And they're asking me for the cosine of 120 degrees. So I need the X value, but of course it's gonna be negative. And so that's where the negative <coughs> one half came from. Now, and if you're not sure about how I do that, I get lazy. I try to be as lazy as possible, right? Um, so I only labeled these in this quadrant because those are pretty easy to, to memorize, right? Three of them, easy to memorize versus like all of these. These that land on the axes are easy to come up with the points, right? You just think of the point, right? The X has gone over one unit, the Y value is zero. The X has not gone over left or right, so the X coordinate is zero, but it's gone down one unit, so it's negative one. Like that's all standard, right? That's all normal. Um, but Notice that I labeled, the, I just went down. So I labeled this point A, these coordinates B, these coordinates C. And then it's a matter of reflection, okay? So this reflects over here, so that's A. This reflects over here, so that's B. This reflects over here, so that's C. This reflects down, it should be here. 
This reflects downward, and so that's C. Downward, that's B. Downward, that's A. This is not really a circle, which is why they're off a little bit, and the symmetry is not exactly there. Uh, mirror it over at A, mirror it over at B, mirror it over at C, or I could have mirrored them over this way, and then if I go back, I get back to the original, right? But they're just mirrors of each other, okay? and that's how I know to label which one A, which one B, and which one C. So back to our problem. Now we're going to do example three. So they're saying, let's go establish some more identities, right? So using that difference formula, or yeah, the difference formula for the angle here, um, this will become a plus sign and it's cosine of the first angle, cosine of the second angle, sine of the first angle, sine of the second angle, and cosine of pi over two is zero, sine of pi over two is one, zero times anything is zero, one times sine is sine, and zero plus sine is just sine. So we've established another identity there. Um, I don't think they summarize them for me, but that is an identity. Um, and we have already explored something like that when we were doing the graphs. We know that these are the same just by a pi over two shift, right? So we've already established this concept in the past. Um, so now they're saying, let's uh, go develop another one. So for sine, now, here what they're doing is they're going to say that this is just some angle and they're going to call it alpha, okay? And so then what I'm really trying to figure out is sine of alpha. Now, I already know that sine of any angle is equivalent to cosine of alpha, over, I mean, pi over 2 minus that angle. So this sine of alpha should be equivalent to cosine of pi over two minus alpha from the previous example, example three. Then if I fill in what alpha represented, alpha was the angle pi over two minus theta. So if I subtract pi over two minus theta, that's pi over two minus pi over two, which cancels and negative, negative theta is a positive theta. And so now I have another identity that I can use now let's use this information to go figure out sine of alpha plus sine of beta. So I want to figure out sine of alpha minus beta, a formula for that. So I'm going to let alpha plus beta equal theta. Okay. And so then from this up here, we, or from example three, actually, we know that sine of alpha equals cosine of alpha over two minus that angle. We know that this theta is alpha plus beta. We know that theta is the same theta, so it's alpha plus beta as well. And then we distribute this minus sign and we regroup. So alpha, I mean pi over two minus alpha is grouped together here, and then minus beta is written down over here. And so then if I use the cosine formula, the difference of cosine formula, it's cosine of the first angle, cosine of the second angle, plus sine of the first angle, sine of the second angle. And then remember that we had that formula that said cosine of pi over 2 minus alpha is the same as sine of alpha and sine of pi over 2 minus alpha, right? Sine of pi over 2 minus alpha is equal to cosine of alpha. So we're putting that in there right now. And then this one stays the same and that one stays the same. And so um, now we have established an identity for that particular sine of uh, sine beta. So now we have that formula. So now we're going to use that one to come up with a formula for sine of alpha minus beta, similarly to how we did one for using cosine of alpha minus beta to find one for cosine of alpha plus beta. So we remember that subtraction is the same as plus a negative. And so then if I apply the rule that we just established, so sine of alpha plus beta is sine alpha, cosine beta, cosine alpha, sine beta, put them all in there, first angle, first angle, second angle, second angle, then use your odd and even identities, so cosine of negative beta is cosine of beta, cosine of negative beta, is, or I'm sorry, sine of negative beta is negative sine of beta, and then these multiplied together stay the same, but a positive times a negative will make negative of this value, and so now you have another formula 
for the difference of signs. So now we've established this one first and then this one. Um, now, for me personally, I wrote this on the side because this is how I remember it. I don't remember sine, cosine, cosine, sine. I remember sine, cosine, sine, cosine. And then just whatever order they are here, that's the order I put them in there. And then for the other ones, I switch, right? Because I already have sine of alpha over here, so I need sine of beta over there. I already have cosine of beta on this side, so I need cosine of alpha over there. That's just me, how I memorize it. Um, but I think after a couple problems, I just try to stick to the formula so that you're using the formulas. But these are equivalent, right? Um, whether if I keep the minus sign out of it, right, because the minus sign is still there, still the minus sign, cosine of alpha, cosine of beta, times sine of beta, times sine of beta, right? So this is commutative property of multiplication. It is the same. Um, so however you memorize that or whether you have them on your note sheet, it's up to you, okay? I just find it more helpful if I memorize things because I can do things quicker, okay? But if you're not memorizing and you're just, um, using the formula and be sure to have all of those formulas on your note sheet so that you can use them when you take the test. Because if you come up with a problem that requires that formula and you don't have it memorized, you won't even be able to complete the problem, right? So it's very helpful if you either memorize them or have them handy as you go through the review and the test. Okay, so here we have this problem here. Now, before I go into that problem, I want to talk about something. I did it a couple of ways, but there's actually a couple more ways that it could have been done. There's a lot of ways it could have been done, and I'm not going to spend all that time trying to go through every single one. Okay, I just want you, I did two of them so that you could see that it's the same, but understand there are more than two options. Okay, what I wanted to do is you want to write this as sine of some angle plus another angle or sine of some angle minus another angle. Now, I also wanted to do both plus or minus so that you could see you'll get the same thing. But even if I come up with a different pair here, as long as it equals 19 pi over 12, it still should come up with the same answer. So, how do I figure out these numbers? Well, I just picked the ones that came to me, but how do I know that they're gonna work out and that I can use my unit circle? I'll explain. So what I have is I have sine of 19 pi over 12. The first thing I probably would have tried to do is sine of 18 pi over 12 plus pi over 12. Because 18 pi over 12 plus one pi over 12 equals 19 pi over 12, right? But this can be reduced, right? 18 pi over 12 can reduce to 3 pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2 is an angle on our unit circle. But pi over 12 cannot be reduced. So therefore, this cannot be reduced down to something that's on my unit circle, so I cannot use this pair, okay? So then we'll try another pair. So we'll cross that one out. Try 17 pi over 12 plus 2 pi over 12. Now just give me a minute here. I'm going to write down all the different combinations for addition, um, just so that I can talk them through. And then we will figure out which one of these work and then the one I chose. Just bear with me. Okay, so we've got all of these. 
Now, I, I wouldn't continue and do nine and then 10 because it's the exact same thing as this since addition is commutative, right? So we wouldn't want to do that. It's just going to be repeating all of these. So if I go to the top, 17 pi over 12 can actually not reduce. Oops, that's way too big. 17 pi over 2 does not reduce, and that's not an, an angle on my unit circle. So I cannot use this pair. 16 pi over 2 does reduce to 8 pi, and 8 pi is 16 over 12. What am I doing? 17 pi over 12 does not reduce 16 pi over 12 is 4 pi over 3 and that is a value on my unit circle and then 3 pi over 12 also reduces to pi over 4 which is also on my unit circle so this one I could have used I didn't but I could have now let's see here 15 pi over 12 that reduces to an angle on my unit circle and 4 pi over 12 reduces to an angle on my unit circle. I could have used this pair. I didn't, but it's okay. <laughs> then we have 14 pi over 12, which reduces to an angle on our unit circle, but five pi over 12 does not reduce to an angle on our unit circle. So this one's bad, meaning I can't use that to be able to find the exact answer. Then 13 pi, over 12 does not reduce. So that one is not on my unit circle. So I can't use this matchup. Um, 12 pi over 12 pi, of course, reduces the pi, but seven pi over 12 will not reduce. So I can't use this pair. 11 pi over 12 does not reduce. So I can't use this pair. And then 10 pi over 12 does reduce to five pi over six, which is on my unit circle and 9 pi over 12 reduces to 3 pi over 4, which is also on my unit circle. So I could have used this one. So for addition, this is just playing around with addition. So for addition, I had three different options that I could have used, and all three of them would have led me to the exact same answer, okay? I chose this one. I can't tell you why. It's just the first combination that came to my brain or both of these could be reduced, okay? Um, and so then that's the combination that I used when I split it up using addition. However, I also split it up using subtraction. And you could sit here and play around with the subtraction. I mean, really, you could go, you know, 20 pi over 12 minus one pi over 12. That'll give me 19 pi over 12, but this doesn't reduce. Then I did 21 pi over 12 minus 2 pi over 12, and both of those do reduce. So the first one reduces to 7 pi over 4, which is on our unit circle, and the second one is pi over 6. And so I decided to use that one for my difference. So I use the formula, and when there's a minus sign here, there's a minus sign in between the two um, terms there. So sine of 7 pi over 4, cosine of pi over 6, sine of pi over 6, cosine of 7 pi over 4. Remember, I'm using this one, the one that I think of, sine, cosine, cos sine, cosine. You could also memorize the formula sine, cosine, cosine, sine. How you do that is up to you, whether you have to memorize it or if you have it written down. I think from now on, I'm going to just try to stick to this formula. Just for consistency, right? Um, so sine of 7 pi over 4. 7 pi over 4 is where? 7 pi over 4 is over here. And so it's going to have the same coordinates as Z, but in the Y value is going to be negative. So that means sine will be a negative square root of 2 over 2, and cosine will be a positive square root of 2 over 2. Then pi over 6, they're both positive for pi over 6. So um, cosine is square root of 3 over 2, and sine is 1 half. Then I multiply top times top, got this, bottom times bottom, got that, top times top, got this, bottom times bottom, got that. They have a common denominator, so I put them together and make one fraction. Okay. Then for the same thing for my combination when I did addition. So I reduced this down to 3 pi over 4, reduced this down to 5 pi over 6, and then did sine, cosine, sine, cosine, first angle, second angle, second angle, first angle. And then 
this value is square root of two over two, this value is negative square root of three over two, this value is one half, this value is negative square root of two over two. Multiply those guys together. Notice that the negative is on the wrong person, but it doesn't matter because when I multiply them, I get negative square root of six, just the same. Here, um, this is a plus sign because these were addition and now the negative is over there. But again, I have to multiply them together. So I still get a negative just the same. Um, and so then I end up with the exact same answer as my final result. And if you would have done the other situation, if you would have done this situation or this situation, I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that um, in one of them, this guy is going to be negative and this guy is going to be positive, but it'll still get you here. And in the other situation, this guy is going to be negative and that guy is going to be positive but you'll still get to the same answer, okay? And so I mean, you can try them on your own, do it and, and, and show that, right? Just so that you prove it to yourself, yeah, that what she's saying is true, okay? Um, but that's what's gonna happen and that's why all of those give us the same, the same result, okay? Um, so now we're gonna move on to example five where it says, hmm, they give us two values and then they start to ask us for these values, okay? So they give me sine of alpha is three over five. I know that's opposite over hypotenuse and they tell me which quadrant alpha lives in. Alpha is between pi over two and pi, which means this is pi over two, this is pi. So that point is in this quadrant somewhere. And I went ahead and labeled it. Opposite is three, hypotenuse is five. I did the quadratic or the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the x value. And because I'm in this quadrant, that x value should be negative. Then I did the same thing for b, but I keep them separate, okay? So for sine of b equal to negative one over square root of five or negative square root of five over five, I used this one before it was rationalized for the triangle, but I use this one whenever I'm asked to find sine of beta. I just plug in the rationalized one, okay? So um, let's look at that one. So sine is again opposite over a hypotenuse and this time beta is between three pi over two and two pi, which means it's in this quadrant, there's the point. So the opposite is negative one, the radius is square root, or the hypotenuse is square root of five. I did the Pythagorean theorem, figured out the x value was two and over here the x value is positive. So let's go look at this triangle and find cosine of alpha. Remember, cosine of alpha is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent is negative four and hypotenuse is five. Here again, this is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So we're talking about the two over the square root of five. And if I rationalize that, I get two square root of five over five. So then now we're gonna use our formulas to find this. So cosine of alpha plus beta, if I apply the formula, I get this expression. And then cosine of alpha is negative four fifths. Cosine of beta is two square root of five over five. Sine of alpha is three fifths. And sine of beta is negative square root of five over five. Those were given to me, right? So then I multiply top times top, I get this. Top times top, I get positive three square root of five. And then I combine the like terms, I get negative five square root of five over 25. The five and the 25 reduce, so I get negative one square root of five over five. Over here, I apply this formula, and then, and I use the formula as is, alpha, alpha, beta, beta, sine, cosine, cosine, sine. So then I get three fifths that was given, the two square root of five over five I found, plus from the formula, negative four fifths from over here and then sine of beta, which was given square root of five, negative square root of five over five. Multiply these together, I get six square root of five over 25. Multiply these together, I get positive four square root of five over 25. Add those together, I get 10 square root of five over 25, which reduces to two square root of five over five. And um, now it does say here that the proof of the sum and difference formula for tangent function theorem is in the textbook and left for you to read on your own. So we've already gone over all the proofs of the sines and cosines. 
Um, so they just leave that one there for you to go look at if you really are curious and want to go see it. Um, I think I may have looked at it out of curiosity back when I was taking Greek Cal, but normally I just trust them. If you called it a theorem, that means somebody somewhere at some point in time proved this thing is true, right? So I believe you. <laughs> and I'll take what you've done and work with it, right? So that's usually what we do with theorems. And when you get the calculus, some teachers will like to go through the proof of each theorem so that you can believe that it's an actual theorem and you can believe that it's true and you know where it came from. Um, and then there's other instructors who are just there. Why go through all that trouble when someone's already done it? If you're that curious, you can go look it up, right? It's there for everyone to read. It's already been written in books everywhere. So let's not harp on how this thing came to be and let's learn how to use it, okay? And that is your goal for um, this. So these are the formulas that we're gonna use and then I'm gonna show you how to use it. So then example six says, use the sum and difference formulas to establish identity. So now they're going to ask us to do this. So I'm going to follow this formula up here. There's a minus, so it's the bottom formula, right? Minus is this formula. So tangent of the first angle, and then that should be minus tangent of the second angle, and then over tangent or one plus tangent of the first angle, tangent of the second angle. So then over here we have tangent of pi over two is zero minus tangent and then one plus zero times tangent and zero times tangent is just zero so the denominator is just one and here zero minus tangent is negative tangent and so we have negative tangent in the numerator negative tangent over one is negative tangent and so we proved another identity that tangent of two pi minus theta is equal to negative tangent theta so let's see, what else kind of problems do they have of you in this section? So now this example says, use the sum and difference formulas involving inverse trigonomic functions. So find the exact value of cosine, sine inverse of two thirds plus tan inverse of negative three fourths. Okay, so I, I'm gonna have to have two triangles again because these are two different angles and I don't know where they are, okay? So remember, when you're given the expression like this, you have to consider the domain, the restricted domain of sine when you're given this. If I was asked this, sine of theta equals two thirds, if I'm asked this specifically, like this is literally what I have on my paper, then I can look at the whole unit circle. But when I'm given sine inverse, I don't have that choice. I have to stick with the restricted because you're talking about inverse functions. So I have to stick with the restricted domain of sine, okay? Because the restricted domain of sine is what allows me to even have an inverse in the first place, right? Because it has to be one-to-one. -one. So because this is specifically given to us, I can only consider where the domain of sine is, which is over here, the restricted domain of sine. So over here, in order for me to get this, remember that this is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is always going to be positive because it's a distance, right? But then if two thirds is positive, that means that my opposite sign should be positive. And if it's positive, remember your sign is also, um, instead of looking at it as opposite over hypotenuse, you can also look at it as y over, over r, right? And so then, your y value would have to be positive, which means I would be talking about a point up here in the first quadrant, because down here in the second quadrant, the y values are negative. So then um, we use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the missing side, and because it's positive x on this side, it stays positive square root of y. And I already know that sine of alpha is two over three, right, just by, rewriting this, if I rewrite this, it's sine of alpha is two thirds. And I know that I can use this 
table to figure out cosine of alpha. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so I get square root of five over three. Now for the tangent, it's different, right? So tangent is, um, I could rewrite this, this inverse thing, because I'm talking about inverses and I was given the inverse, I'm restricted to the restricted domain of tangent, which happens to be the same as the restricted domain of sine. So I can rewrite this as tangent of some angle. I'm calling it theta, just to be consistent with the alpha and beta of the formulas. I can say tangent of beta is equal to negative three fourths, but I know that that's gonna be the opposite over adjacent. Now, if you're looking at this quadrant here, the x value is positive no matter which quadrant you're looking at. So remember that tangent can also be expressed as y over x. And the x must be positive in this restricted domain, which means it's the y value that's going to end up being negative to make this negative 3 fourths. So that means that my point will be down here in quadrant 4. And so the x value, the x distance is 4, the y distance is negative 3, Use your Pythagorean theorem to figure out the radius. And then now you can start doing these values. So remember, sine is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. And then cosine is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And so I have that value there. And so then they say, use this information to figure out that, right? So the first thing I do is I change this into um, the formula. So I use the formula over here cosine of alpha plus beta is this formula. And so I'm literally just filling it in. So cosine of alpha is square root of five over three. Cosine of beta is four fifths minus, minus sine, sine of alpha, which is two over three, and then sine of beta, which is negative three over five. So top times top is four square root of five, bottom times bottom is 15. Um, top times top makes a positive six, bottom times bottom is square root of 15. If you put it all over one fraction, unfortunately it doesn't reduce. So it stays looking like four square root of five plus six over 15. Now example eight says um, solve the equation sine theta minus cosine theta equal to one, where theta is between zero and two pi. So in order to do this, what they do is they first um, divide everything by square root of two. And remember that dividing by square root of two is the same as multiplying by one over square root of two, multiplying by the reciprocal, right? So they multiply that here, they multiply it here. And then I didn't like that they were trying to jump to this so quick. So I went ahead and rewrote it differently. I went ahead and put the sine theta in the front and this in the back, and then left this one as plus a negative one over square root of two. So instead of minus, I wrote it as plus negative square root of two, and then times cosine. So that I have sine of an angle, cosine of some other angle, sine of that other angle, times cosine of theta. And then um, what I had to do is I had to go figure out what angle fits this criteria, right? What angle has a cosine of one over square root of two? And if I rationalize that, that's square root of two over two. Or a sine of negative one over square root of two. Again, this rationalized is negative square root of two over two. And I found out on my unit circle, that is going to be um, I need a positive cosine and a negative sine. Positive cosine, negative sine. And so that's going to be this guy because this is the one that has a square root of two over twos. So it's got to be seven pi over four. So then once I know what that angle is, so I went ahead and rationalized that, rationalized that, and then figured out the angle. Um, now I know that this is cosine of seven pi over four and this thing is sine of seven pi over four. And so then I use that theorem, the identity, right? So this becomes sine of the first angle plus the second angle. And then on this side, I rationalize that one too. And so it just keeps coming down. And then notice that this problem was not, does not have the inverses, right? It doesn't. So if it doesn't have any inverses in this problem, then I am allowed to look at the whole entire unit circle. 
So where does sine equal negative square root of two? That's where is the y value equal to negative two over two? Well, that happens here and here when the y value is negative two over two, negative square root of two over two on the unit circle. So that means my this angle is either going to equal pi, 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi k, or it's going to equal 7 pi over 4 plus 2 pi k. But I want to know what theta is. So I went ahead and took the 5 pi over 4 and subtracted 7 pi over 4, but the plus 2 k is still there. 7 pi over 4 minus 7 pi over 4, but the plus 2 pi k is still there. So when I do this subtraction, I get negative two pi over four. This comes down, my comma comes down. This subtraction is zero and this comes down. So then I reduce this, I get negative pi over two plus two pi k. And then that's just two pi k. So then I started plugging in some values. Um, this is negative. So I had a hunch that plugging in one um, or plugging in zero, I should say. Yeah, I plugged in zero and then I plugged in one. So when you plug in zero, you're not really gonna be adding anything because this will be zero. So you get negative pi over two. And if I plug in zero here, this is gonna become zero, which is there. And then when I plugged in one, but I know that the domain here, they told me at the very beginning that they only wanted X values between zero and one and zero could be included. So this is not, this is not greater than zero. So I crossed that one out because that's not a possible answer. But zero is a possible answer because of the bar, the equal bar. So I tried k equal to one, I added two pi. So when I took negative pi over two and I added one multiple pi over two, I mean two pi, I ended up with three pi over two. And that is um, in the interval. And when I plug in one here, I'm sorry, here, it just gets two pi, but that is not included in the interval. Notice there's no bar there, okay? So because of that reason, um, this one's not gonna be included. So the only two solutions I have here are zero and three pi over two for this. And if you're unsure on whether or not you did it correctly, and if you, um, you're just not sure, right? If, if everything you did was good, you can always check your answers. Remember, when you're solving equations, you can always check your answers. Is sine of zero minus cosine of zero equal to negative one. This is in radians, so let me put my mode in radians. Sine of zero minus cosine of zero, and I get negative one, so yes. And then try sine of three pi over two minus cosine of three pi over two equal to negative one. So sine of three pi over two minus cosine of three pi over two, and I get negative one. So these answers do check out. So I did do the problem correctly, okay? Um, so just be careful. If for some reason you're doing the problem and you type these in as your answers and it spits back the message, like you need to find all of the values, it's probably because you didn't take all of the values here that fit this information. Make sure you're taking all the values that fit that information, okay? Not just one of them. Okay, so I had some extra problems in the homework that I wanted to cover. So what if happens if we have secant, right? All the formulas we had have had sine, cosine, and tangent. They haven't had secant, cosecant, and cotangent. All you have to do is remember your reciprocal identities, right? Remember that secant is the same as cos one over cosine, right? So first thing I noticed is this is a negative angle. You definitely don't wanna start off with a negative angle. So I added two pi, which gives me another angle that's in that same position. So it'll have the same secant value, um, but it's a positive uh, angle. And then I went ahead and tried to break this up using something that would reduce, right? I came up with 21 pi over 12 minus four pi over 12, but just like I showed you in the other problem, I could have come up with two pi over 12 plus 15 pi over 12, those both reduce, um, or three pi over 12 and 14 pi over 12. I mean, there's a bunch of things you could try, right? As long as 
this comes out to this, and these both reduce the numbers that are on your um, unit circle, you can do it, okay? And then just go with it. You will end up with the exact same answer, okay? So here I changed it to one over cosine of this angle. Then I applied the cosine um, difference identity. So cosine, cosine, sine, sine, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. And then I use the unit circle to find this value is 32 over 2. To find this value is 1 half. This value is three, negative square root of 2 over 2. And this value is square root of 3 over 2. Then I multiplied top and top, bottom and bottom, top and top, bottom and bottom, and got this wrote it as one fraction. Anytime you have something one divided by something, what that means is reciprocal. So I just took the reciprocal and the reciprocal is four over square root of two minus square root of six. Now, I do need to rationalize my denominator because it will not allow me to type that in as my answer. So I multiplied by the conjugate to rationalize the denominator. So we got four square root of two plus four square root of six. After I foil all of this out, I end up with the square root of four minus the square root of 36. And then um, the numerator stays the same. Denominator becomes two minus six, which eventually becomes negative four. And then everybody can be divided by, well, four divided by negative four is negative one square root of two. Positive four divided by negative four is negative one square root of six. And then that is my, um, my answer there. Okay, so then now let's look at number seven. So there was one kind of like this in the home, in the uh, main lecture. I believe it was, oh my gosh, way back. Um, it was like this one where you had it expanded, right? And then you had to um, go backwards. The only thing different here is a sine, cosine, cosine, sine. So you have to recognize that when it's not cosine, cosine, it's sine, cosine, but that's going to be the sine of identity. And then for the signs, whatever symbol is in here is the same symbol as in there. So alpha and then beta. And if I add those angles together, I get 90 degrees. And sine of 90 degrees is on the unit circle. 90 degrees, the y value is one. And so we just get one there. Now for number 15, this one, we've gone over one kind of like this. I just wanted you to know that they could change it up on you, okay? They might not have two inverse functions. They might just have the other angle just explicitly given to you. It makes half, it makes half the work not as long, right? So I went ahead and I applied the formula. Now let me make sure because I'll notice that I tend to get my signs mixed up and I always make a big mess and check. So if this is a plus sign, then it's going to be tan of the first angle plus tan of the second angle over one minus tan of the first angle times tan of the second angle. So the formula was employed correctly. Now I can do tan of pi over three. That's sine over cosine. So this value over this value is basically the twos are going to cancel and you're going to end up with square root of three over one, which is square root of three. So I know the tan of pi over three. These guys are going to be square root of three. The issue is, is trying to come up with tan of sine inverse of four fifths. So we do have to go build our triangle. Now, when it says sine inverse, I need to think of the restricted domain for sine, which is um, quadrant one and quadrant four. Now, because it's this, sine alpha is four fifths, um, that's the opposite over the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is always positive, and because this fraction is positive, it means that the opposite sign is also positive. You can also think of this as y over r as well, right? So the y value will be positive four, the radius is going to be a positive five. I did the Pythagorean theorem to figure out that the x value will be three. And in this quadrant, that x value is positive as well. So then how do I find the tangent? The tangent is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse, I mean, I'm sorry, opposite over adjacent. So the opposite is four and the adjacent is three. So now I know what tan of that is. So I know this whole entire quantity is nothing more than just four over three. 
So I've got four over three plus the square root of three, and then one minus four over three times the square root of three. And so then I went ahead, I noticed that I had complex fractions. So I went ahead and multiplied every single term by the common denominator. And the common denominator for all four of those terms is three. So I multiplied this by three, the three is canceled, giving me four. I multiplied this term by three, giving me three square root of three. The one by three, giving me a three. And then this term by three cancels, leaves me with minus four square root of three. This is not a rationalized denominator. So I need to rationalize it by multiplying by the conjugate, three plus four square root of three. So then I foil the numerator out, I foil the denominator out, and I end up with 12, and these two are like terms, 25 square root of 3, 12 times square root of 9 is 3. Combine the like, or actually I multiplied those together first, and then I combined the like terms and got 48, plus the radical part, 25 square root of 3. And the denominator, I foiled this out. The middle terms actually cancel here. So I end up with 9 minus 16 square root of 9, which is 16 times 3 which is nine minus 48, which gives me negative 39. Now the computer did accept this. If it didn't, I would have put the negative in the very front. Um, since it's only got one term downstairs, I can put that negative in the very front. So if it didn't like this, I would have just typed in this, but they are equivalent. Okay, so now, um, now we're going to go over another problem. It's another one of those solving the equation problems. And so they give me the um, domain of the solution. So here I have sine theta minus square root of three, cosine theta equal to one. So then for in this case, I know that on my unit circle, I have square root of three over two, right? It's the only place I have square root of three. So what I did was is I divide every term by two so that I could see that square root of three over two. So then I split this and I wrote it as one half times sine and minus square root of three over two times cosine and then still equal to the one half on this side. Then I rewrote this instead of minus square root of three over two, I wrote it as plus a negative square root of three over two times cosine. And so then I rearrange these in the same step, though. I also swap those around so that I have sine, cosine, and then it should be cosine, sine, actually. So I should have switched these around, too, um, when I did this. So I should have swapped these as well. So then now I have that, and then that means this, oh, I was trying to figure out what that angle would be, right? So what angle is going to give me these values? So let me rewrite this, and I'll show you where that came from. So here I have cosine of C, right? It should be one half and sine of C should be um, negative square root of three over two. That means that the X value is positive and the Y value is negative. That happens down here in this quadrant. And the one that has this is an X value and this is a Y value is five pi over three in the unit circle. So um, that angle has gotta be five pi over three. So I just replaced it with the angle that it needs to be and that it is. So then I use the formula there and I rewrite this as sine theta plus um, five pi over three. So then now I'm trying to find the sine of this weird angle equals pi over two, one over two, I'm sorry. So where does that happen? Sine is the y value. So where is the y value positive? It's here and here. And for what angle do the y, does the y value equal one half on the unit circle? Well, on the unit circle, the guy with the one half y value is pi over six, and then also five pi over six. So those are gonna be my two responses. This weird angle is gotta equal pi over six or a two pi multiple, or five pi over six and a two pi multiple. But then I need to figure out what theta is, so I subtracted five pi over three from both of those responses, 
and I ended up with negative 3 pi over 2, of course, plus this 2 pi k. And here I ended up with negative 5 pi over 6 plus this 2 pi k. So I started with k equal to 0, but when I did that, I got negative 3 pi over 2 and negative 5 pi over 6. Remember the restriction for theta between 0 and 2 pi. These guys are not in that interval. So I can't have those two solutions. So I tried k equal to 1. And so then I got, um, I got negative 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi. That gave me pi over 2. Negative 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi gave me 7 pi over 6. And then I thought, well, maybe there's some more answers that might work. So I tried for k equal to 2. And when I did add another 2 pi, I ended up with 5 pi over 2, which is bigger than 2 pi. 2 pi is the same as 4 pi over 2. This is too big. And then I ended, when I added 2 pi to this, I ended up with 19 pi over 6. 2 pi is 12 pi over 6. So this is also too big. So these are out of the interval as well. And so once you start getting values that are out of the interval, that you don't have to keep adding. Because the more you add, the more it's still going to be out of that interval. Um, so then I get up just these two answers, pi over 2 and 7 pi over 2. And again, as always, if you do all the work, you want to check your answer. So make sure that your answer is correct. So check to see if it works for pi over 2, and then check to see if it works for 7 pi over 6. If it doesn't, that is your cue that something somewhere went wrong. Okay, and then you would go back and try to investigate and figure out what it is that went wrong and where it happened at. So, um, let's read my calculator. So, let's do sine of pi over 2. I am in radian mode. Um, minus, oops, what is going on here? Minus square root of 3, and then get out of the house and do cosine of pi over 2. And I do get 1. So this one checks out. It's good. Then do the same thing again. Sine of 7 pi over 6 minus square root of 3 times cosine of 7 pi over 6. Close it. And we get 1. And so it checks out there as well. So we've done everything properly and we found both of those solutions there. Okay, that is the end of 8.5.